This morning's panel on Indonesia will be covering cultural, political and religion, religious facets of Indonesia. It will be chaired by Andrew McIntyre, who I'll introduce to the platform to get started. Um, it'll finish at 10 and there'll be Q&A from 10 to 10.15. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, n nice to be back here with you. I'm, I'm back and forth this morning betw with, between uh, uh, here and the, uh, uh, the meeting with the Central Party School from Beijing. There's a, there's a another meeting going on in the middle of campus and some of your number uh, are over in that meeting this morning that are particularly China enthusiasts. Um, anyway, we're focused on Indonesia here this morning. Um, uh, our brief is to keep our remarks pretty short, so there's lots of, lots of chance for you folks to come in on whatever you want to uh, come in with questions, comments or what have you. Um, uh, I, I suggest uh, that we're going to take the three of us together. Greg has to leave at 10.15 because he's got to get over to a high level meeting over in Prime Minister and Cabinet. They want to pick his brains on. Well, he'll tell us what they want to pick his brains on. Um, we're going to keep Greg t um, to the third presentation because our hunch is that that means you'll have him freshest in your head and you'll probably ask questions about him first. Uh, before he has to leave. So that, that's roughly our plan of action. Um, we'll aim to speak for um, five to ten minutes, ten absolute max. If anyone um, has just a quick question of clarification along the way, you can't understand what somebody's saying or you missed it, feel free to interrupt, but otherwise I suggest we keep questions and comments till ten o'clock and then we'll have a, a big bracket of uh, our discussion. One other preliminary um, uh, uh, point to make is that um, within the Asia, uh, Asia and Pacific portfolio at this university, uh, uh, Indonesia is one of the crown jewels. There's, there's just a huge number of Indonesia specialists here. Uh, outside of Indonesia there's nothing like the concentration of Indonesia specialists there are at ANU anywhere else in the world. It's a very large concentration. So, and, and what we're doing is just scratching the surface of what's here. We've tried to get three different people to give you a, a sense of the range, or, or some of the range of interests and expertise here, but there's all sorts of other folks here. So one uh, th suggestion for you is thinking about, for you to think about what you can get out of this place while you're here or when you go back to uh, wherever you've come from whether it's from any of the three of us or anybody else uh, at ANU. Uh, if, there's, um, if there's people with, with expertise in areas that matter for you, feel free to be back in touch with us um, after you get back home uh, and try and get, uh, get whatever out of it you can. Now look, I'm aware there's... Um, uh, where's the clock? I better... Don't let me go beyond ten minutes. Um, uh, uh, I'm aware there's people in the room here who'll know a lot about Indonesia. And there's also people in the room who won't know much. So we're going to try and look after both, uh, both, both sets of interests. What I'm going to do is just some sort of broad scene setting remarks on the nature of this extraordinary uh, uh, political and economic uh, transition that's taken place uh, in Indonesia and is continuing to take place and say something about um, uh, Indonesia in the world. And then Ariel's going to come in and give some broader um, social and cultural uh, perspectives and then Greg's going to come in and draw, in, draw attention in particular to um, questions relating to position of Islam in Indonesian society and in, in, in Indonesian political life. So that, that, that's roughly the map. But as I said I was going to do some, some broad um, scene setting remarks. Um, for those of you who don't follow Indonesia, the single most important thing to understand about Indonesia at the moment is that it has been through just the most uh, spectacular um, uh, political change. Uh, by world standards, uh, uh, this is a, a, an amazingly rapid, peaceful, and if you can use the word, successful, transition. The number of people who've died, the number of the extent of suffering, the extent of traumatization is quite small for size of population 
and speed with which this has taken place by world standards. That's not to say there wasn't upheaval, but by world standards, this is an extraordinary uh, process. Um, again, for those of you who don't follow Indonesia, I mean, the big changes, or the dramatic changes, come with the Asian financial crisis at the end of, uh, end of the last century, um, where Indonesia just suffers these twin radical shocks. It's at that time the most radical economic reversal recorded anywhere in the world in the 20th century going from very rapid growth to radically negative growth. So this huge economic collapse. Uh, and not too surprisingly, that has political consequences and the long-standing um, uh, military-based uh, regime of Suharto collapses with it. Um, what emerges um, uh, from that uh, 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 crisis uh, is that Indonesia transforms itself politically and rebuilds itself uh, economically. And as I say, by, by world standards, it, it was an amazing process. Um, uh, many, um, uh, many, many scholars of Indonesia and many Indonesians themselves are quite critical, um, quite disappointed, quite underwhelmed by the changes that have taken place, seeing them as being disappointing in um, uh, lots of ways. Um, and there's just no question, there's still all sorts of problems that Indonesia needs to tackle. Uh, but, but, but I would put to you that the, 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 the really big point is that this has been an amazingly successful uh, transition. How does it come about? How come it was, in my terms, as successful uh, as it's been. Uh, in simple terms, I'd give you um, uh, three, uh, three sorts of ideas um, uh, uh, for, for why, that's, uh, why it's happened the way it has. Uh, one is that there was a remarkably broad and strong, what you could call with, with hindsight, uh, social consensus on the need for democratisation in some fashion in Indonesia. There was a strong public desire for this. Yes, no question, students, NGOs, the act activists, political activists of various sorts, the media were at the forefront of, of, of pushing the case for reformasi, for political reform. But underneath that, there was a broad social interest a broad public interest uh, in seeing uh, uh, major democratic uh, uh, change. That would be one reason, and, and, and that would perhaps be the most important reason. Uh, a, a second reason is that with some trial and error, there was quite a bit of experimentation going on in the, in the first years, with some trial and error, uh, Indonesia's uh, ended up designing, creating for itself, tolerably effective, tolerably effective institutions. It's developed, a, it's revised a constitution and a set of key laws that produce, for, that produce reasonably workable institutions. And again, the sort of headline version of that would be um, they're provided for um, uh, uh, free elections that have been repeated now a number of times uh, at the national and uh, uh, sub-national level. Um, uh, uh, stable rule of law. The Indonesian um, legal system's got endemic problems with corruption. But there's some parts of the judicial system that have worked uh, reasonably okay. And two to look at in particular, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, and some recent uh, uh, innovations with, um, uh, with Islamic courts, which have brought, um, and, and uh, Greg may end up saying something about this, I'm not sure, but have done uh, a great job of bringing uh, improved justice at local level, yikes, two minutes, uh, for, for the poor. 
Uh, anyway, so lots of, uh, lot, and I guess the last quick thing I'd say about why things have gone well is that the, uh, generally speaking, if we had our economists here, they'd tell you lots about this. Um, uh, in Indonesia, for most of the last decades, done a pretty good job with economic policy. Sound macroeconomic policy, well, basically they've been sort of cautious with their spending, uh, and reasonably open, reasonably pro-competition um, uh, uh, policy settings. Um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is there's still a heck of a lot of problems Indonesia has to wrestle with. I've mentioned one already, uh, endemic corruption, uh, re re really serious problems with corruption. Um, uh, poverty remains a much more extensive problem than it should be uh, for a country at this level of development. Um, there's serious issues of inequality, particularly between uh, uh, the eastern half of Indonesia uh, and the rest. And then you'll find sharp pockets of poverty, even in central Indonesia, uh, on, on the most populated island of Java. So problems of poverty. Uh, education systems are much less good than they should be. Health systems have got all sorts of weaknesses. Um, a quick word before Sam chops me off. I said I'd say something about Indonesia in the world. Um, uh, Indonesia has now put its head back up uh, in world affairs. As you'd guess, for the first half decade or so um, uh, after the transition began, it was focused inwardly. It's now looking outward again. Uh, Indonesia is, um, uh, has become a, a significant player uh, regionally uh, and it's now starting to try and reach out globally. It's driving things in ASEAN again um, uh, and now as, uh, uh, as, 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 as the most vibrant democracy uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, it's interesting to see democracy become one of the themes in its foreign policy, both within the region um, uh, and more broadly. Uh, Indonesia's um, sought to offer itself as a model for reconciliation and bringing things together in various ways uh, into the Middle East. Uh, it's actively doing things through the Bali Forum. Uh, it's a country that everybody wants to cooperate with these days. Almost everybody else in the world likes Indonesia at the moment. Now, that's partly because this particular government is so popular internationally, because it's, an inter it's very internationalist in its orientation, it's pro-international cooperation, um, and it's partly because Indonesia's got its act together a bit more than it had previously, so it's in a position uh, to do more. But as I said, uh, popular internationally, not so popular at home, this government. Um, uh, one of the ironies here, and this is, this is sort of, I guess, the point I'll finish on, um, if you sort of think about the imaginable future, for all the, what I'm saying is wonderful progress of the last 10 years, in terms of governments and in terms of governance, this is probably about as good as it gets. About as good as it gets. Um, you've got a president, and he's sort of on the way down now, but a president who's not a crook, who's not stupid, and you can get stupid presidents, um, uh, 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 who, who works really hard. Um, you know, that's not a bad combination. Um, uh, and almost all of the people that are conceivable successes, um, uh, the combination, I would say, uh, is not quite as, attra as attractive. Um, but it, it's, the point's actually deeper than this particular president or the, or the government that he's got. Um, I said before, Indonesia has tolerably effective political institutions. It's a heck of a messy system to try and run. It's a heck of a messy political system. People complain about this government being slow and indecisive, and it is. But you watch anyone else try and make it work. It's a hard system of government to make work. I'm not saying that I expect things to fall apart, but we cannot take uh, Indonesia's democracy for granted uh, indefinitely into the future. Thanks.
Basically, what I want to do is rather than talking about Indonesia, I would like to share with you very briefly my, one of my current research projects okay, um, about Indonesia. Um, of course, I have to also warn you that, like everybody else, I do all kinds of uh, research works, and I don't want to be labeled uh, by the one project I'm doing at the moment, because <laughs> sometimes you know it's very easy to associate somebody with something that uh, you know about that person. What I'm doing at the moment is to try to understand how Indonesia worked very hard to rebuild a new nation state in everyday life. Okay. This is a continuation of what Andrew just introduced to you. With the fall of a long-standing authoritarian government in 1998, what was dictated for the people is now gone. What was defined, who they were, no longer uh, valid. What you've got now is a, a kind of a vacuum in state power right at the center, big one really where now the rest of the population is trying to fill in in their own ways. And Indonesia, as Andrew introduced to you, is so diverse that you have a whole series of disorientation, competition, and you know, uh, putting bits in what, in how, where Indonesia should go from now on to the future. I'd like to approach this study on how Indonesia try to redefine itself um, by taking uh, materials that are not usually used in area studies. What I'm referring to is that I have been collecting materials that you can describe as popular cultural materials, as site, as field of expression of how Indonesians want to project themselves. Okay? You can collect materials for the same sort of questions from other sort of um, categories, such as you know, the speeches of the political elites, um, the state curriculum uh, in schools, and so on, which is something I try to stay away from. Particularly, as I am doing my research work, I'm also thinking very hard about what area studies might look like in the second decade of the 21st century. I belong to one generation that was trained under area studies, and area studies in the past 50 years or so have been focusing on modernization and nation state building. For that reason, area studies in many parts of its history in the past 50 years or so has been focusing on economy, political elite, state administration, and so on, education, and so on. Okay? What we've seen in the last few years is a major shift. Not only that the old area studies in crisis, but also in the broader context of my research, we have noticed, for example, the decline of faith in the national project. As a result, people are more interested in the study of transnationalism. Okay. The, the decline of faith in modernization theory people looking at something else, okay? As well as the decline, I would say, or at least the impasse in some areas of the political economy studies and try to move away from something else which we call the new humanities. It has inherited from the old humanities in anthropology, in history, in philosophy, but with a new twist now, a more critical one, where the old discipline has been now more or less combined, okay? So, for example, in culture studies, people take a lot of interest in the question of power and politics. Never take culture innocently as something, you know, like the essence of people's life. So that is the broader context of my research work, but in the, doing that, I have actually prepared some data on my PowerPoint showing you there's something else that is happening on the ground in Indonesia on the areas that I'm interested in. For example, the number of print media has tripled in the last 10 years since the fall of the new order in 1998. Radio station has jumped maybe three times 
household with television chat triple to 16 million. Um, television networks nationwide has doubled from 5 to 10, not to mention the local um, television networks that rise to something around 200 in the country, and so on and so on. I have a lot of data that I was going to show you. Um, Facebook users, um, 10 years after the fall of the new order, Indonesia ranked seventh in the world. As of this week, we are second in the world, only after the United States. With UK number three, India number four. I have the details of the number actually, but you know, somehow it's not working here. Um, in popular culture as well, um, pop music, for example, for the first time in the last 10 years has simply break new um, records in sale figures, in the millions, for example. Uh, it, some of the Indonesian pop songs, for example, also dominated the sale figures in the neighboring countries. Uh, films broke new grounds both aesthetically and commercially, way superseding the Hollywood blockbusters. Um, you have heard a lot about Indonesia being the largest archipelago in the world, the largest uh, Muslim populated country in the world. I doubt if you have heard Indonesia is home of the biggest jazz festival. I bet you have not heard of it. Okay. I was going to show you also some uh, pictures. I, am, I don't think it's working now. But in defining new Indonesia among Indonesians themselves, ordinary Indonesians, uh, I look at people who watch television, for example, recognizing, acknowledging that no institution in the country captured the, intention, the attention of the populations as many hours on a daily basis as television. Okay, how can you study Indonesia without looking at this? So I've been looking at a lot of that. And of course, as you can predict, what, one of the things that you can find in Indonesia this is among those who watch television is the Korean wave. Okay, it's a universal thing, if not universal, at least an Asian thing. Okay? Um, it's just too bad that I, don't, I cannot show you the picture I've prepared. We usually associate um, the Islamization of Indonesia with the veil and the orientation to the Middle East um, development. With the Oriental pop cultures like the Japanese, the Taiwanese, the Korean, one might assume perhaps the middle class secular um, Chinese minority were the major fans of these new culture products. I have a lot of pictures, hopefully, if the guys are working still and can show you later. I have lots and lots of pictures how millions of girls in the veil, in the Islamic veil, are so crazy for Korean popular. <laughs> in one show, there was a, I attended one event uh, last year where there are about 2,000 girls and maybe about five boys. <laughs> I was one old man there taking pictures. <laughs> They, were, they must be wondering why I was there. <laughs> there was huge, maybe, um, posters of all the Korean pop stars, usually males, maybe threefold of the real size, and all the girls have to climb the chairs just kissing the pictures in Ville. <laughs> and not only that, asking the other friends who are in Ville to take pictures of them, hugging and kissing the pictures of the Korean films. <laughs> so what does it all mean? Okay. This is the kind of questions I raised for the future of Indonesia. Unfortunately, my time is limited, so I will stop right here, hoping that it strike a chord with some of you who are still young, at least young at heart, and we'll talk more about this. I understand that time is not perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. That's actually a very good lead into what uh, some of the things that I want to talk about. And as has been mentioned, my focus is on Islam in Indonesia. But let me give a little bit of a broader context first of all. Over the past decade, attitudes to Islam globally have changed considerably. We have the impact of 9-11 and other terrorist attacks which have powerfully shaped public, media, Western government and academic views on Islam and Muslim communities. One obvious outcome of this is the rise of a powerful spectre of threat associated with Islam Another consequence is a tendency to essentialise Islam. We've all heard these following statements, I'm sure, many times. Islam is a religion of peace. George Bush, 
Um, Tony Blair, John Howard all uttered something that's very similar to that. Good Muslims are moderate Muslims. Terrorists twist and deviate from true Islam and so on. So you get the impression that there is one clearly definable manifestation of Islam and it's certainly not a radical form of Islam. It's not just tabloid media and politicians who say these kinds of things, but also plenty of academics as well, some of whom are very knowledgeable about Islam, some of whom indeed are Muslim. But there are lots of bandwagon jumpers as well, who realise that governments and publishers, governments are making a lot of money available, publishers will publish books that are putting forward a particular view of Islam, and so this can be very good for their research funding, very good for rapid career promotion. So there's a socio-economic aspect to the production of knowledge about Islam uh, over the last 10 years. Not unlike what happened during the Cold War where lots of academics made their careers writing about, for example, the communist mind. Mind. The sorts of things that people study now as an example of what academics shouldn't be doing. So, if we have a look at Indonesian Islam, it can be viewed through these, or is viewed through these similar kinds of prisms. Um, it is most often extolled as the most moderate and pluralist Muslim community in the world. Rarely do people making those statements define exactly what moderation is and whether moderation by itself is a good thing. I'm sure with a little bit of thought you can think of times in the history of your own countries where moderation was seen perhaps to be a bad thing, a sign of weakness, so these things are never problematised. Um, Indonesia is also often praised as the most successful Muslim democracy in the world and indeed a beacon to other Muslim nations. Uh, and the recent rise of terrorism in Indonesia has been viewed as an aber aberration, as something very unusual in the history of the nation. Indeed, Islam in Indonesia is seen as otherwise peaceful. And quite often, this rise in radicalism, violent radicalism, is attributed to international influences, particularly wicked Middle Eastern influences, Saudi influences and the like. There's a lot of literature on this kind of um, discourse. So in this very brief talk, I want to problematise the simple and perhaps comforting perceptions of Islam, especially in the case of Indonesia. And I want to challenge some of the assumptions and also show that there's very little that's straightforward about these topics. Indeed, conundrums abound in when we're studying Indonesian Islam. For us as researchers, this is a good thing. There are no easy, down-pat answers, or there shouldn't be. If you hear someone saying that understanding this Islamic group or this terrorist group is simple, it's just this one factor, you should be mightily suspicious of them, because it's almost never as simple as that. We have lots of meaty topics to be researched and debated, and I find, even though I've been studying this for 20 years, it's endlessly fascinating and I'm constantly made aware of how much I don't know and how quickly things change. So the verities of a few years ago may no longer hold up to close scrutiny today. So it's a constant challenge to try and understand um, uh, these, these developments. So here's the first conundrum. And to begin with the fact, um, this is related to what uh, um, Ariel was saying, Indonesia is rapidly Islamising. We have lots of evidence for this. What we mean by Islamising is not so much that people are shifting from other religions into Islam, but rather that Muslims are becoming much more pious, much more observant. Many more Muslims are praying five times a day, observing the fast during the month of Ramadan, uh, would be reading Islamic texts, um, sending their children to Islamic school, and as Ariel has done a lot of research on, also consuming Islam, buying products, often very middle-class, yuppie kinds of products, because they're being sold with an Islamic flavour. This includes Islamic banking, Islamic clothing, Islamic holidays. There are all sorts of ways in which you can express your, your Islamic faith through your consumption patterns and it's a way of um, uh, strengthening your identity as a pious Indonesian citizen. 
So we know that we have this rapid Islamization taking place in society. The assumption often is in the West that more Islamization means more Islamism. And by Islamism, I mean people wanting Islam and Islamic values formally present in public life. So more Sharia law, for example. More restrictions on the roles of what non-Muslims can do in public life. Um, now in Indonesia, one of the conundrums is that parallel with this increasing pietism, we have had a decline in the popularity of Islamic parties. At the last general election in Indonesia in 2009, Islamic parties scored their worst results in 60 years of um, elections in Indonesia. They got less than 30% of the vote. Keep in mind, 88% of Indonesians, according to the last census, are Muslims. So what's been happening here is a delinking of personal piety from political choice, at least at the moment. Who knows, in 10 years' time, whether that dynamic will change. But nonetheless, this has been a trend for at least 20 years. It doesn't mean to say that Islam isn't a political factor, but increasingly what these newly pious Muslims are doing is looking for parties that are very competent, particularly economically. The sort of parties led by um, Susila Bambang Yudhoyono, the current president, who Andrew was talking about. His party very selectively uses Islamic themes. It's not in a very exclusivist way, but it's a way that appeals to a lot of um, I suppose what we call in Australia aspirational voters, people who are middle class and want to be upper middle class and the like. So they want governments that are competent, can deal with the problems the nation's facing, can deal with them well, but also a government which is informed by Islamic values. They're not necessarily wanting Sharia law to be implemented, but they like the fact that their president is an observant Muslim who will pray five times a day, who does seem to be a good man. Um, another Quran conundrum. Indonesia, of course, is, is uh, uh, exalted as a moderate and pluralistic nation. But it also has, in recent years, a growing problem with religious intolerance, which the government is largely blind to. We have had violence towards so-called deviant sects within the Islamic community, such as the Ahmadis. Three members of this Ahmadiyya sect were killed earlier in the year with surprisingly little reaction from the rest of society. There's also increasing difficulty for religious minorities to build houses of worship in areas where they are, in fact, a minority. Um, so. Overall, you would have to say Indonesia still has a very good record on religious harmony, but it is selectively so. And there are some issues where Indonesians can be remarkably cold-hearted about the persecution of religious minorities uh, and violence towards them. And this begins with the president and goes right down to grassroots of society. We can find similar kinds of selectivity in Australia, of course, as well. I don't want to claim Indonesia is anything um, unique here. Um, the Muslim democracy issue. Uh, Hillary Clinton, Kevin Rudd loves talking about how Indonesia is this uh, wonderful Muslim uh, democracy in the world. Uh, and indeed, Indonesia, of course, has a very large majority of its population who are Muslim. So it's a Muslim majority in that sense. But Western leaders are often saying there's something Islamic about this democracy in Indonesia. And my question would be, is that so? Certainly Muslims helped to create this, this really remarkable democratisation that Andrew spoke about. Muslims were a key part of that. But how much was Islamic values and Islamic principles a key driver in this factor? Is it the case that Westerners because of their preoccupation with and perhaps an anxiety about what manifestations Islam may take, have been concentrating on the religious factor as a primary element, when in actual fact those religious factors are secondary or tertiary factors. That what people were seeking with democratisation was something that was not at all religious, or not particularly religious. But we have ascribed those religious values to it because of our concern about how Islam should manifest itself in the world. My own view is that, in fact, Indonesia's democratisation has very little to do with Islam at all.
just as we find similar reform processes underway in the Middle East and in Northern Africa also have remarkably little Islamic content to them. Um, final thing to say about terrorist motivations and terrorism. This is something I do a lot of research on. Recently I spent a lot of my time interviewing terrorists. This is the most of all the complex and contentious topics that one can study in Indonesian Islam. This is the most contentious. Almost nothing is straightforward with this topic. Even within the one group of terrorists responsible for a terrorist action, when you interview them you can find a remarkable array of factors that they will mention as the reasons for them engaging in violence. So again, when someone says they're bombing us because they hate our democratic values and our freedoms, it's basically crap. That's got nothing to do with why people are doing that. And in order to understand the reasons why, very close research has to be undertaken. Enormous amount of research has been undertaken on terrorism across the globe in the last 30 or 40 years, and um, it produces a bewildering array of explanations as to why this happens. I'd also just note, between terrorists themselves, there is no consensus. Jihadists often have very sharp debates about who should be the targets of their actions, when you should launch those attacks, what sort of modes you should use, should be assassination bombings, you'd be targeting Westerners and non-Muslims or your own officials. Here's one figure for you. In the last year and a half, all of the victims of Indonesian terrorist attacks have been police. I think the figure is now at about 22, 23 police who've been killed um, by terrorists and not a single Westerner. So that's one change that's taken place. There's still people there who want to kill Westerners, but they just haven't been undertaking any actions. That's a quite dramatic change in the space of a few years. Um, the final thing to say about this is that this notion that terrorism is something new, some virus which has infected this otherwise healthy and moderate body, um, body Islamic in Indonesia, uh, that's also uh, completely fallacious. Terrorism or violent jihadism has been present in Indonesian history almost since independence in 1945. We have really the granddaddy of violent jihadist movements in Southeast Asia, Darul Islam, formed in Indonesia in late 1949, uh, 1948, and is present right up until this present day. It's one of the progenitors of Jemaah Islamiyah. It's never really gone away. There's always been a fringe of the Islamic community that's been drawn to this kind of Islamic messages. It's been mixed with messages from in international fora, but it's mixing with something that's also very homegrown. Finally, um, I'd just like to apologise for having to leave early, but if anyone wants to talk, and I know there's very little time for questions, if anyone wants to have a chat, I'm around the next couple of days, just send me an email, what have you, and I'll be happy to do so. Thank you. My name is Paul, I'm a graduate student at the Astro National University. I've served several years in both Iraq and Afghanistan, trying to understand complex and certain groups of terrorists myself. And what we've done in the United States Army is actually bring on war anthropologists to help us with that discursive analysis. And I was curious, some anthropologists decry this as an international scholarly uh, engagement. What are your thoughts on that, sir? Uh, uh, as an academic involved in it, I think it is a I see no problem at all. In fact, I would be um, really surprised if a serious scholar was to mount an argument like that. Terrorism is uh, a very um, powerful phenomenon in the world at the moment, and like many other things, it deserves careful, scholarly study. Uh, one of the things I find in Indonesia, for example, is that there is almost a prejudicial approach to anyone studying terrorism. So I go to Islamic University, very good Islamic University, and I talk about an Islamist party, people will be very interested. If I say I'm going to talk about jihadists or terrorists, um, people will just switch off. Here's another Westerner coming along, telling us about how bad Muslims are and things like that. My message to them is that this is in fact uh, not only is it a major problem for Indonesia and for Indonesian Muslims, because many of them are victims of, of these kind of terrorist attacks, but academically it is it's a fascinating field, uh, it's important, and it's also immensely challenging try and understand it. So you, for example, mentioned the, the value of bringing the anthropologists. I'm part of a team of four researchers here. One of them is psychoanalyst, 
So I can read the documents of the Safari office and read it from my background, which is political science and history. And I identify with here these ideological streams, here the authors I mentioned, here are the critical events in their life. So that would be the kind of interpretation I would do based on their, their private source computers. The psychoanalyst comes along and he says, ah, no, that will that's one way of reading it. He's another way of reading it. Let me give you one example. Mukbus, the older brother of Ron Rosie, one of the Bar Thomas. My psychoanalyst friend, when he reads the text, he said, Mukbus is suffering from an almost uh, inescapable sense of filth that he was born into, you know, it was after the birth around him, he was born, he came from his mother's body, he felt impure throughout his entire life. And he can read these texts, and look at the way he refers to his wife. His wife was a body odors, the menstruation, the effects of aging, and look at the way he idealizes going to heaven and the vestal virgins that he will meet there, who don't have any of these unpleasant, uh, you know, human odors or you know, consequences of aging. They talk constantly about the effluent, the cultural effluent, sort of things that are real studies. US sitcoms and, and busty women running around in bathers. For him, when he writes about this in a very graphic way, it's this cultural pollution, which is washing over Muslims and making them impure. And so jihadism for him is the ultimate expression of his desire to purify himself. And dying as a martyr, was in, in one way for him um, this uh, ultimate achievement of self purification. I think that's actually a really valuable way to look at this, but it's an entirely different interpretation from what say anthropologists would have, political scientists, theologian, and the like. I think this is a field where um, multidisciplinary approaches can be very productive indeed. You're at the Does um, uh, one have other questions for Greg? Um, an email on the floor on the website or just ask for the organisers. Other questions? Comments? Curiosities? Uh, okay. um, I guess my question was to Greg, but maybe it's not. We'll put it out anyway and just see what we can do with it. Um, I was quite interested in this um, change of, um, the, the, I guess, Islamic terrorists targeting foreigners to targeting police. Um, would you have a perhaps um, comment on that? And, to see in country. Um, I wanted to ask about some of the social movements that have formed out of these social media networks, um, particularly following the Jakarta Hotel bombings in 2009, where there was a movement called Indonesia Unite that sort of emerged online, people sort of pushing for action at sort of this very grassroots <coughs> level, you know, through online communications channels. And I guess I wanted to ask whether you feel that this online activism can really have any real impact in Indonesia's political development. 
my quick answer is, it does have some impact, but very little. And a lot of observers, I think, particularly advertisers, like to overread it. The good example with true effect is the case of Rita. Um, there was one lady um, who complained about hospital service where she was in, and she was charged with um, defamation and brought to trial and put in prison. People were so angry about it, worked on Facebook, and decided to pay on her behalf a penalty. It, it, and they paid in terms of the coin, you know. So it did many, many sex of the big banks to pay uh, the bank. And it is a symbol. Uh, so, but usually, it has to work that way with the movement. I think you should put something bigger than that. And my worry is that with the new technology, most nurses become so preoccupied with, what do you call it? With um, trivial, you know, Everybody doing like this. Unlike the people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just a little put back to that. Um, uh, to to our response to your question, going in a different direction. Um, there's an increasingly sophisticated um, industry um, uh, in the media uh, around political parties. It's, 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 it's big business. Winning government, lots turns on, and you find all of these political entrepreneurs <laughs> uh, offering themselves up to political parties, connecting to political parties. The most, some of the most skillful emerging politicians have uh, the skills of this sort themselves, and they're all looking for ways to get some kind of edge in the political marketplace. Um, uh, I don't follow this closely myself, but I hear from many people that they're trying to find ways of tapping into new technologies, social networks, to use it um, uh, for the advantage of whomever they're selling their services. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Natasha. I'm a second year at the Crawford School. And my question will be a little bit about Asia Pacific. Well, how do you measure Indonesia's involvement in the Asia Pacific? And what are the urgencies of Indonesia in being involved in Asia Pacific? What's in it for Indonesia? And um, what do you think the common ground social and culturally for Indonesia to involve in Asia Pacific? Good question. Um, uh, and for any of you who don't follow Indonesia, um, you can ask a question of this sort of a lot of countries. You can ask of this Thank you. 
most developments, ranging on anything from water things like um, postal services, um, uh, health services, all sorts of technical stuff that goes on, through to dramatic stuff, uh, the sort of the trade was talking about, uh, cooperation on security. Um, uh, it, an area that a lot of people focus on is uh, uh, trade and financial cooperation. Uh, opening up prospects for more commerce rather than less commerce. Um, and the argument there would be, in the end, that contributes to um, uh, uh, welfare of citizens. So there's room for two views on this. My, my view would be close to the same. <laughs> Andrew, um, I want to be able to see this. There's a lot of local people. Anybody in the field is not local, and you can come back to some local. Can I try? I'm sure I'm sending an answer. I have a question about economic You mentioned that there are public poverty. There are a large number of inequality. And especially during the Ramadan season, you have to be aware that the food consumption, for example, the price of rice and chicken pepper could go up by to like 200%. So what I'm saying is that the middle and lower class family in the region just simply cannot afford these basic needs. So how do you, how, how confident are you to say that Indonesia achieved economic success, knowing that this price is good question. Good question. And again, you could ask this question about very many uh, countries. Um, <laughs> two types of response. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it short. Um, well, so here's my response. Uh, my response uh, would be if you look at the big the economic picture, uh, Indonesia. Uh, like China, like a whole range of countries, uh, has made dramatic progress in reducing the number of its citizens who live in poverty. Dramatic progress. Um, uh, and uh, I would argue that um, reducing the number of people that are in the most abject um, uh, social and welfare circumstances uh, one of the greatest things um, governments can do. Not the only great thing, but one of the great things governments can do. That's the easy part of the answer. It's the hard part of the answer. Um, what's also happened in Indonesia, as in China, as in many places, is that at the same time as this is happening, inequality has increased. Everyone's been getting richer, or nearly everyone's been getting richer. But some people have been getting richer much faster than others. So at the same time as the bottom's coming up, the gap between the bottom and the upper is rising. So it's, it's a relative issue versus an absolute issue. And which do you put your, which do you put your emphasis on? And this, in a way, ties back to where I finished up in my remarks, thinking about the future of democracy in Indonesia. I mean, again, you ask this question to lots of countries. What are the political consequences? In the end, of having widening economic inequality. Does that come back to my countries? Yeah. Hello, um, my name is Katja from the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I have a question to Aya. Um, first, thank you for your very nice presentation. It's a pity that it was so short, so I have two follow-up questions. Uh, the first one is, I'm not quite clear about what you're actually looking at. Are you looking at uh, the national identity, how it's built by the people themselves, or how it's lived, or it wasn't quite clear to me. And the second one is, how on earth does the Korean way connect to Indonesian national identity? <laughs> My study is not about national identities, but identities in communication. Okay. Which include what it means to be a woman for Indonesia. 
what it means to be the middle class, what it means to be a Muslim. They are in big competitions. And as the data shows, Korea is one major factor. They want to be one. If only you know how many Muslims now wanted to go to Korea and study Korean language, more than they want to study about their research. There are lots, lots of stories to tell you about this fans. You know. And when it started in 2003, we thought it's a free thing that I They'll be gone in two, uh, two years. It has not so far. I know it's going to have a limit so far somewhere. But yet it indicates something. And that something is at least is the fluidity of what identity can be made of. Not a fix like what um, my, my colleague agreed. Uh, just said earlier, it doesn't mean that being a Muslim being like in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, so it can be many things. So the Muslim women that I've talked to have seen no contradiction between being Muslim and Korean, dance Korean dance, learn Korean languages rather than Arabic, for example. They see no contradiction whatsoever. So that's what I'm looking at. Uh, I'm getting the line up signal from the Uber boss down here. Let's <laughs> see uh, another question. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Atal from the Hopkins Center. Um, I saw one other person. Yeah, um, let's take two questions and keep them really brief, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get really brief answers. Yeah. yeah, I just have one uh, simple question. I want to hear a little bit more about um, your observations on the commodification of Islam in Indonesia and uh, how you see this affecting gender paradigms and new normatives. Uh, my name is Alpuku. I am Kodi Kushin, Professor Ariel. My question is, Professor, what do you think the loss of societal imagination of Islam is because the, 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 the demarcated boundary of religion is negotiated? Both are really, really good questions, and I'm afraid you know we don't have the justice to do or to answer your questions. But be very, very brief. I think both require a lot of discussion. But to understand that question, uh, to, uh, to try to answer that question, I think we need to look at the bigger what happened during the new order. Very briefly, during the new order, the authoritarian government dictated, decided, defined what means to love anything. What it means to be a Muslim, they decide one thing. Okay. Now is the time for a lot of Muslims to try to redefine that. And there's more than one other answer to the question. Okay. So they're in big competitions. Same thing with how that relates to the gender issues. Uh, some are good news, some are bad news. Meaning some are more liberated, some are really, really bad. You know, Disempowered because of Muslim women. But the whole competitive uh, forces are at work and have not yet found a resolution. So we are witnessing now a twilight of things. Meaning a lot of colors, beautiful time to study religion. Because a lot of potential and possibilities, unlike what it was during the new order when everything was stable, defined and failed. The family if you give it. Okay. So a lot of questions as you can mind. That's my question too actually. So sorry for being so you know undecided about the answer. Well, I just want to say, I say, why did it come to free drink side? So, okay. so <laughs> um, just before we go to the next segment, let me get back to right where I started. Whether you're interested in the major or other things, before you leave here this week, um, you think about what you can get out of this place, whatever your interests are. I mean, if you're back at your university or where you're heading with employment, um, if there's some kind of relationship that you want to get going with this guy, this guy, or Somebody else you've encountered, um, uh, uh, haven't encountered, but you can find on a website somewhere. Um, we're, we're keen to try and get links going. Take seriously this notion of being not just a national asset, but a regional and a global asset. So if you've got an idea about how we can connect up with things you want to do, let us know. Um, we'll see what we can uh, do. Can't promise everything, but we can look at it.